So, Mark, Mark, what, thank, thank you so much. Mark, Mark so nicely started by saying 462 people, numbers don't pass me that easily, so massive stress now, because I got <laughs> no idea what to do. Uh, uh, 65, did he say? Uh, uh, and then, and then uh, he also said the magic that's small. It's like, come on, you're setting me up here. Uh, but, uh, but no, I am actually really, really grateful to be here. Thank you so much for showing up. Uh, this is much more important to me than you think it is. It's actually uh, the rest of my life, if you want. And so um, we, we, we you know, thought about this quite a lot and then um, decided that we're going to run through the content very, very quickly because normally uh, we have a lot of questions. So are you comfortable? Uh, anybody here planning to ask questions so, just so that I know? Uh, okay, those laughs are not reassuring, uh, but uh, yeah, um, but, but I, think, I think that would probably be a good use of our time. Uh, so I'll try to get to 45 minutes maybe of content and then the rest of the, of the evening for uh, our conversations. Uh, I think sharing between us is going to be an incredible uh, um, value add rather than just the theory if you want. Um, this is, wow, wow, look at that. This is London. And I have to start by asking you, why do you guys walk so fast? <laughs> no, no, I, I swear I'm, make, I'm not. So I tried to walk faster than you today. <laughs> I swear I'm not making this up. Google told me, would you like to switch to driving directions? <laughs> uh, seriously, what's going on? So, so why, why do people here? So I, I, I run this test in every city I go to. When I landed in Gatwick, I basically look at the, um, you know, the bags, baggage claim, and when I pick my bags, I look at the Britishers or, or the residents of London, and I see, the, see them zooming out, okay? And basically, I notice a few of them, four or five, and I always find them waiting at the Gatwick uh, station still, Gatwick Express station. So, uh, d d you know, what happens? And it was a Saturday. Like, why are we rushing so much? Why, don't, why do we sometimes not make decisions that make us happier? In all honesty, if you actually stop to think and say, Gatwick Express is every 15 minutes, the worst case scenario here is I'm gonna be there 15 minutes earlier or 15 minutes later on a Saturday. Do I really need to rush or should I, like the Middle Eastern tourists, you know, leisurely <laughs> walk around and enjoy life, like listen to music and look at everything and maybe stop and, at M&S food or whatever. Anyway, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I actually think that most of what I'm going to talk about today is about making choices. And really, uh, my, my core message is that your happiness and the survival of our humanity, believe it or not, is about the choices that we, uh, the, this group of 460-something people will make. And so, uh, 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 how many of you have read the book or have watched some of my videos? Not everybody, so that's great. I'm, I'm going to bore you a little bit with telling the story again, but it, it, because it really is important to connect us. Um, I, um, I'm, a, I'm a corporate um, you know, success story, if you want. I spent my entire life in uh, Microsoft, IBM, and, and, and Google, and uh, came to the top of Google, became the chief business officer of Google. So what do I have to do uh, with happiness? Um, I wrote my book uh, literally 17 days after my wonderful son Ali died. And, uh, and Ali uh, was not just my son. Ali was my son and my best friend. I had him at a very, very young age. But also, he was my coach. And I know you may think of that as strange, but I'm not exaggerating when I tell you Ali, at age eight, would start to teach me things that still today make the person that I am. He was extremely wise and incredibly peaceful and happy all his life. And so, um, uh, you know, when, when, uh, when I was miserable uh, in my late 20s, um, I actually would go to Ali all the time to try and understand a little more about happiness. I was, I was very, very happy until age 23. And then by age 29, I was literally wealthy beyond my, my wildest imagination, had everything I could wish for, had a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful uh, wife who I still believe is the most amazing woman on earth, even though we're not together. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, and she gave me two amazing kids and I was completely depressed. Everything I tried to do to get out of my depression would make me more depressed. I bought cars, I went on vacations, I bought gadgets, whatever I did, I became more and more and more depressed. 
And so I decided to look at my, my happiness uh, from an, a, a way that I could understand. And I, I say that with love and respect, but not everything that works for people who are spiritual or meditate and so on and so forth worked for me at the time at all. So when people told me to say, um, it got me really upset, okay? And, and, and seriously, uh, I started to look at the topic as an engineer, but an engineering topic, an engineering view of happiness is quite interesting, but it's completely uh, you know, uh, lacking, it's incomplete if you want. And so I would go to Ali and I would explain to him what I found out and he would explain it to me uh, in how in his instinctive understanding of happiness and somehow that made me find the model that started to make me happy almost all the time. No one is happy all the time and we'll come back to that later, but uh, I could find my happiness every time unhappiness attacked me. Uh, um, um, uh, July uh, 2014, Ali came to visit us in Dubai uh, for a vacation, then went for a very simple appendix, um, uh, you know, appendectomy, I think they call it, uh, uh, you know, and, and five things went uh, wrong. The, the doctors did five mistakes in a row. And in four hours, Ali left our world. And so you can imagine if someone is your son or your best friend or your coach and they leave you, any of those would make you collapse. But for some reason, I uh, had a very uh, unusual reaction to, to losing Ali. Uh, my reaction, you know how they say a life for a life? Uh, uh, you know, and you know, every one of my friends was like, you have to, you know, ch you know go you know, after that doctor and so on. In the only message constantly ringing in my mind was that Ali's life is not worth a, li a life, that Ali's life was worth millions of lives. And instead of wanting to take a life, I wanted to give life. And I don't know exactly how that happened, but I basically t told myself I will sit down, I will write what he taught me, and if I can manage to share it, uh, forget that stuff, uh, if I can manage to share it with 10 million people, uh, if I can make 10 million people happy uh, and tell them about my, uh, you know, what Ali taught me, then maybe I've honored him. It doesn't bring him back, but it definitely makes our world slightly better than the day he left. And so um, I, uh, I wrote Soul for Happy. Within four and a half months, I had publishing deals around the world. I became a bestseller almost everywhere it launched. Uh, and then uh, 30 langu 31 languages so far. Uh, and then the 10 million happy mission, actually thanks to the UK, was overachieved within eight weeks. So, uh, so what happened is I, um, you know, if you, if you want to believe it or not, but I was supposed to, to, to talk in the US in one of the major networks, as always, you know, uh, some other major news happened, and so they declined, and so I flew to London, had the chance to, to, to uh, be interviewed by Channel 4, and you know how it is, you know, in the news networks, uh, maybe you don't, so I should tell you. Uh, your news networks are very harsh, right? They're constantly telling, looking for the negative thing about everything, including happiness, okay? And, and it was really a very stressful interview, and somehow, in the middle of the interview, life helped me, or God or the universe or whatever you, you choose to, to, to believe, and the, the, uh, a blue fly started to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, fly in the studio and literally landed on my nose, <laughs> okay? And so we had to stop the recording, okay? And when, I, as they tried to chase the fly out, uh, I basically had two minutes for myself to actually tell myself, you know what, whatever they're doing, Let's just find in your heart what it is that you want to say. And so when they came back with the question, I spoke for three minutes that went super viral, viral on the web. So within, uh, within uh, I think the first day it was watched like a million times. By the fourth day, it was the largest, the most watched, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, news clip of Channel 4's history. Uh, today, it's 3x that. Okay, and I don't actually measure things by views. I measure people that join the mission when they view a video, but they take an action after that, which basically means they got the message and they actually started to invest. And so uh, the small team of volunteers that was surrounding me, believing in the 10 million happy mission, cornered me like my managers uh, all through my sales career cornered me and said, you set a very low target. And so we took it up uh, to uh, what we call a Google scale target which is a billion happy, okay? And you may think a billion is a crazy number. I promise you, I promise you, I'm standing in front of you here, I promise you we'll get there. A billion in today's world on the internet is not a big number at all, and it, this is not my mission, okay? The, the thing about this is because I worked on the, in technology and on the internet for so long, I actually understand that if this was about me, I would end up being Kim Kardashian, 180 million followers, it's not a billion. Okay? And that would be the biggest failure 
for this mission ever. This mission is about you, okay? And the way to make that happen is, I always ask people before I speak about happiness, if I, I, if I manage to give you a few things that change your mind and make you happier, make me a simple promise and tell two people about what you learned, okay? And make them promise to tell two people if it becomes useful to them, and they tell two people and so on. That's the exact uh, definition of the exponential function. If you've seen Ali's favorite movie of all time, it was called Pay It Forward, okay? If we manage to do that, I guarantee you will get to a billion people in five years. And this movement has been going reasonably well so far. We're actually in the tens of millions already. So before I start, let me please raise your right hand and say, if you, you know, don't say, but if I, if I, if I, uh, if I tell you two things uh, that will make you happy today, you will tell two people who will tell two people, I promise. I promise, good. If I, I always say if I tell you more than two people, if I tell you more than two things, then tell more than two people, okay? So 20 is not a big number. Your sister, your brother, whatever that is. So uh, wh let's start with a very quick survey, just so that you, uh, you know, understand some of the realities that we don't always realize when we're rushing so quickly through Gatwick Airport, okay? H how many of you want to be happy? Raise your hand, good. How many of you, keep your hand up please, how many of you actually are happy? Great, how many of those are happy most of the time, 95% of the time or more? Very good. So I want you to look at the room please. There were people still raising their hand when I said 95% or more. You know what that means? It means that those who want to be happy and are not as happy as those others are missing their target. Okay? If that was your job, you would be fired. Do, do, do you understand? And, and for, some, for some reason, we prioritize our job and we never miss the target, or at least we try very hard not to miss the, the target. But when it comes to our, our happiness, we're sort of like, yeah, I want it, I want it, I really want to be happy, but it's okay. It's okay, it's fine, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Right? And the real question is, why is it that we are not happy all the time. And I think this, this, were, this is truly going to be the core of what uh, my, my message will be today. But before we do that, maybe I should ask you, which of those make you happier? If you, if you don't mind, honestly, by the way, we're just family here. Uh, raise your hand on the ones that make you happy. Actually, uh, if more than one makes you happy, raise your hand on the one that makes you happier. A sexy boyfriend, girlfriend? Okay, we have fifth, seven <laughs> hands. Okay. Is, is that because the others don't have a sexy boyfriend, girlfriend? Okay. Anyway, uh, so I would probably say 2%. Uh, a, a vacation or a weekend? Okay, that's a good maybe 20%. Uh, money and safety? Oh, that's interesting, actually. No, so this is not a typical group. So not a lot of people are into money and safety. Achievement and growth. Of course, everyone. So always I get like 60% of the audience uh, chasing money, uh, ch chasing uh, progress and, and, uh, and achievement and growth. Quick question. So how many of you know someone who is with a very sexy boyfriend, girlfriend, and is miserable? <laughs> All right. How many of you know someone who's with a very sexy boyfriend, girlfriend, and is miserable because of them? <laughs> right? Great. Okay. So, so, so the truth is, there is no intrinsic happiness value in a sexy boyfriend, girlfriend, right? <laughs> Good. Uh, vacations, how many of you uh, felt happy one and a half weeks after their vacation ended? <laughs> right? Normally the happiness that comes from vacations is fleeting, so there is no intrinsic resilient value of happiness in vacations, right? Uh, uh, money, how many know, uh, have heard of recent millionaires or billionaires that committed suicide? Okay, uh, how many uh, um, you know, have, uh, know about people who have everything for the rest of their life and are not happy at all? I know many. So remember, I lived in Silicon Valley for a long time and with my current work, I meet with a lot of billionaires, miserable. <laughs> okay? uh, by, by the way, also you, if you remember, hmm, uh, you told yourself when you graduated university, if I make a thousand pounds, I'll be happy. And then when you made 1,000 pounds, you wanted 1,200, and then when you made 1,200, you wanted 6,000, and so on and so forth, right? So there is no intrinsic happiness value in money, safety, and luxury. Achievement and progress. Can I ask you a question? I mean, you don't seem to me like people who've just all graduated out of university. So have, have you actually had any achievements in your life at all? 
Yes. Have they made you happy for more than three days? <laughs> right? For most of us, hmm, what happens is we achieve, and then when, what happens when we achieve? We set a new goal. Right? And then we achieve that, and what do we do? We set another one and another one. The goal is constantly moving. Right? And so there is truly no intrinsic value in constantly chasing achievement at all of happiness. There is, it, doesn't, it doesn't make anyone happy. As a matter of fact, achievers are some of the most miserable people on earth. Okay? Because when they achieve, suddenly it appears that I, I can see some uh, wives and girlfriends kicking their uh, boyfriends and husbands. Uh, so, uh, so in reality, the, the achievers, if you're obsessed with achievement, what happens is you're constantly unhappy because it's never good enough. Okay? So the other most important question is, how much of your life are you spending to acquire those things that have no intrinsic happiness value? And be honest with yourself. Would it, would it, would it be fair if I told you 95% of your uh, week after the eight hours sleep, if you manage to get our eight hours of sleep, are to chase relationships, you work the whole week for the weekend to come, you want more money, more safety, you want more progress and growth and learning. We spend most of our life in the modern world chasing those things. Okay? And in reality, if we ch just stop rushing through Gatwick Airport, and actually think to ourselves, I've been chasing progress for the last 20 years. Is there going to be a point in my life where I will say, okay, it's time to be happy now? Okay? Because my mother, when I was growing up, told me this. She told me, if you just withstand life for a little bit, save a little bit, and take a little bit of harshness, eventually you're going to be happy. Okay? I think she meant eventually you're going to be safe. Hmm? But I actually came back to her uh, in my mid-30s, and I said, Mommy, I did exactly what you told me. I'm wealthy, and I'm miserable. Like, what's going on? Is this ever going to change? Okay? And if there is no intrinsic happiness value in this, then you might have to ask yourself, why? Why can we not find happiness? Because when we look for it in those things, we're, look, we're looking for it in all the wrong places. It's exactly as if you have your keys inside your pocket, you know, when you're rushing out of home in the morning, and then you just are so, you know, uh, um, concerned and you want to go out quickly, so you start searching for your keys everywhere, right? And you start searching in the fridge and under the sofa, and you cannot find them under the sofa. Why? Because they're inside your pocket already. And so my first uh, and most important uh, assumption, if you want, is to tell you that happiness will never be found outside you, okay? Because happiness has always been found inside you. And if you don't believe me, you may uh, want to ask yourself, when were you happiest in your life? Okay? Most people will definitely... Anyone here was happiest when they were teens? Okay, we have one, two, three. If those people are single, find them, okay? Because these are the best of all of us, right? Uh, most of us become happier when we become old, not adults. But we're always happiest when we're a child. You, re you realize that? As a child, you just ran around carelessly and went through life very, very happily, and very few things actually bothered you at all until someone was really mean and really wanted you to be unhappy, or a diaper got wet or something, right? And so, in reality, I have done a ton of research on this topic. Like, it took me around 18 minutes on the internet, really, <laughs> um, to, to, to actually tell you something that's really profound when you think about it. Every single infant you have ever seen in your life, if they were fed and safe and given their basic needs for survival, they were lying on their back and giggling. Right? Understand, infants cry, huh? but they cry when mommy and daddy are violent or they're fighting or the place is too cold or the diaper is wet. If there is no reason for them to be unhappy, what's their state? Their state is their default setting is happy. Right? And so you think about this for a second. By the way, you too, huh? You too, when you were that age, you didn't ask for an Xbox to be happy. You didn't want to, anyone to go like, shoot, look, my butt is beautiful to be happy. <laughs> like nothing really mattered to you at all. You didn't want anything from outside you to be happy. You remember that? Now, that to me is what in technology we call your default setting. Your default setting is when you buy a new mobile phone, it works perfectly well for the first day. Remember that? So the battery lasts the whole day, 
Okay? And, and, and then the next day, something goes wrong. Uh, have you bought the wrong phone? It worked well yesterday. No, you started to install weird apps on it. <laughs> right? There is one app that is responsible for reporting what people eat around the world, and you have to like. It's like, yeah, absolutely. Right? Another app that's responsible for making our butts look better, and we have to like. Okay? And it's really, really quite interesting that the phone is not doing anything wrong. The phone is just obeying the instructions it was given, but in the process, it misbehaves. So we, as humans, go through the exact same cycle. We start our life happy, and then we, we start to land into un unhappiness because of weird beliefs. And the best place I found this, actually the, the first eye-opener for me, was a song by Supertramp. We're in the UK. Any of you Supertramp fans? We, you're showing your age. Uh, so, so if you're not a Supertramp fan, I would actually encourage you to download the Logical song, uh, legally, because I love those guys. Okay, and, uh, and listen to the first 40 seconds because it really is the summary of your life. This is how it goes. And that's the story of your life, in reality. Most of us, by the way, many of us, will continue the rest of their lives believing this, that we're supposed to be here to be independent and intellectual and cynical and clinical, and yeah, good for you, okay? Many of us will believe that we're supposed to be here to make more money, good for you. But remember that day when you were six, and they put you in school and they said, hey, you know that playful, joyful, fun thing, you know, like enjoying yourself? No more. No more. You sit here, and when you sit here, you don't talk. Whatever the teacher says, you say yes, even if it's stupid, right? And, and you know, like, it's about time to be serious. And I'm like, I'm six. What's serious, right? Where did that come from? And I, I will tell you, even though I was a, an A student, I rebelled. I was like, why do you want me to do this? And then all of us, without exception, we conform. And when we conform, we become those things. And those things become uh, this. Okay? And in reality, between societal obligations, false beliefs, and illusions, most of us spend most of our life chasing the exact wrong apps, running the wrong apps, and believing that this is the way to go through life. Now, I would actually ask you to read through those, even though it would take us a minute or two, and visit yourself. Don't, don't speak out loud if you don't want to, and ask yourself, do you actually believe in yourself that success is more important than happiness? Do you believe that material possessions is a measure of your success? Because many people around the world do. So they chase that because it's the only way they can measure success, even though you know, teaching, like, you, know, like you, you will hear from the stories today, making others happy should also be measured as success, but we don't, unless we make money. Unhappiness is the tax we should be willing to pay for success. How many of, of us have been told by our parents or our whoever raised us huh, that, look, it's more important to find a good job, and if you're unhappy in the process, that's fine. Live your entire life in an unhappy job, that's okay as long as it pays the, the bills. How many of us actually go and search for a job that makes us happy, rather than gives us 100 pounds more? And take it all, huh? the shape of our bodies matter, the opinions of others matter, we have to fit in with everybody, serious is better than playful. Uh, you know, take things like it's weak to show your vulnerability. This is the second biggest place on earth where it's weak to show your vulnerability. You have to be proper. The biggest, in my view, is New York. If you ask any New Yorker, how are you today, they will go like, I'm fine, I'm, I'm okay today, yes, everything's fine, right? And, and in reality, 
is it really weak to show our vulnerability? And I'm actually being, not, I'm, I'm not trying to be critical, I'm actually trying to show you an external view of what I see when I come to London. 80% of the people in the street are walking alone. Did you notice that? I don't know if 80 is the right per number, but the majority are walking, walking alone. Hmm? We're walking very fast, and we're really sometimes just, we don't seem very happy, but we never stop. We never say, why don't I just ask someone at work if they want to come out with me to lunch? I, I, am, I truly am really surprised. Why is that not the case? There must be one nice person at work. And they, they, they're, they, they, are, they are walking alone too. Right? I'm serious. Why don't we ever change any of that? Now, I'll go back to that little child, by the way, because really this is where the anchor of the story starts. Hmm? The anchor of the story is I spent many years researching happiness the cosmopolitan magazine way, looking for the 10 things that will make me happier. Okay? And in reality, I realized when I remembered that I was always happy unless a diaper became wet, hmm? that in a very simple term, happiness is the absence of unhappiness. That instead of searching for things like vacations and gadgets and money and success and stuff outside us that has no intrinsic value of happiness in it, What's the only thing you can actually do to find happiness is to stop being unhappy. If you stop being unhappy, your default setting is happy. Okay? And, and in reality, you can apply that to any experience in your life. You may have a wonderful partner in your life who, unless you manage to, manage to choose an angel, has a few great things about them and a few annoying things about them. If you focus on the annoying things, by definition, you're going to be unhappy. Okay? It's not their mistake, by the way, it's not what life gave you, because when you leave them and look for another, they will have different annoying things. It's just, it's just how life is. Now, if you manage to remove the unhappiness, suddenly you look at your partner and you go like, Jesus, you're so sweet, I love you. <laughs> right? And it really is that simple. Okay? You can spend the rest of your life looking for that amazing man or woman, good luck. Good luck, it's not going to happen. But our mindset is, I need to find something outside me to be happy. If I cannot find it, then I'm not going to be happy. Happiness is the absence of unhappiness. If we remove the unhappiness, what's left behind is happy. Now, what is that happiness thingy? So, so, uh, so truly, uh, I asked that question for more than 20,000 people. And I could do it here, but in favor of time, I won't. The interesting thing is that we all have a slightly different definition of happiness. And by the way, I could have gone through my entire presentation till the end, and we would end it, and it's all absolutely fine. No one would go like, yeah, he spoke about that thing I believe is happiness, and yeah, he did a good job. But that's not what engineers do. Unless I know what problem I'm solving for, I won't be able to solve it. So I spent a lot of time behind the problem definition of what happiness is. And I did it like an engineer, really. I took data points of every moment in my life I felt happy, and I plotted them on charts, trying to find an equation that actually fits all of those data points. And believe it or not, there is one common thing across every moment in your life you felt happy and every moment in your life you felt unhappy. And you know what that is? Every moment in your life you felt unhappy was an event where life seemed to have missed your expectations. Who here is upset about the rain in London? <laughs> right? A few hands. Hmm? Uh, I'm, I'm very upset about the rain in London. I don't expect to live in a place that has a lot of rain. But all of you don't expect anything else, okay? So rain is fine, seriously. Hmm? The, the interesting question is, if you really, really had plans to suntan with your friends, when it rains, it makes you much more unhappy. The last three days, by the way, made you a lot happier because it wasn't expected to be sunny, okay? If you got the same sun in August, you wouldn't go like, nah, yeah, that's fine, that's expected, that's what I want. So every moment in your life where you felt unhappy with them was a moment where life missed your expectations. And every moment in your life where you felt happy was a moment where life met your expectations. And this can be summarized in a very simple mathematical equation, which for an engineer is the clue to, find, to solving everything else. Your happiness is equal to or greater than the events of your life minus your expectations of how life should behave. Now, I'll give you a second to think about that, because that truly is the only reason you have a brain. Okay? So, so your brain is busy uh, solving this equation literally 
every tiny change of your life, your brain will go and solve events minus expectations. So when I said I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to think about this, hmm? in that moment of silence, your brain was like, okay, is this okay? It's like, is he going to throw something at us? Is, you know, what's going on? And, and our brains are, you come here, and you sit in a seat in the, in the back row, and your brain goes like, is that good? Am I seeing okay? No, I want a seat in the front seat. You go to the front seat, you sit down. No, this one is too hard. And you, then you go in the middle. Oh, no, the air conditioner is here, right? Your brain is constantly looking at every event and comparing it to how it wants life to be for a safe model for you to survive, okay? If it finds that the event meets your expectations, it does something amazing. It's like the best thing our brains have ever done. It shuts up, okay? <laughs> like if there is nothing to worry it, it just stays quiet. And your default setting as a child is happy, okay? What happens is when it finds something that worries it, it starts to alert you in the form of what? Not a thought, but an emotion. Because you pay attention to, attention to emotions, actually we don't anymore, we're even becoming numb to that. Hmm? But, you know, if I make you worried, if I make you, uh, um, you know, regretful or shameful or whatever, you suddenly start to go like, no, nah, I feel so bad, I, you know, I, right? This is literally uh, a survival mechanism, okay? Your brain is trying to find out what's right and what's wrong with life all the time. Now, um, when you think about that, you would find two very interesting definitions. Definition number one is what happiness is. Happiness happens when events match or beat your expectations. Simple. Okay? By expectations, by the way, I don't mean ambitions. Huh? By expectations, I mean how you would like life to be. Okay? So when events meet, match or beat your expectations, happiness then becomes that peaceful contentment that you feel when you're okay with life as it is. So you would have an, a, a wonderful partner, but he has three hairs in his ear. Okay? And if you're not okay with the three hairs, this is never going to work. Okay? Uh, it's as simple as that. Hmm? And, 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 you know, uh, uh, if, you, if you can look at the three hairs and say, actually, this is, I still like him. Or, or the other way around, huh? you, you would have a wonderful partner, but she, you know, uh, tends to speak a little too much when she comes back from work. Okay? Whatever that is. Okay? Now, if you take that definition of happiness, then it demystifies the biggest myth we have about happiness in the modern world. And the biggest myth, I will say that with a ton of love and respect, is an American export, is a capitalist export. Okay? Because we want to productize everything and put it in a pill, we have turned fun into a happiness replacement. So what really happens is, you know, you're so stressed about those three hairs or whatever it is that's stressing you in life, hmm, that by Friday evening, you dress beautifully, you go out and get drunk, and you have a lot of music playing in your ears, and you're really trying so hard to do what? To get your brain to stop solving the happiness equation. The minute your brain stops solving the happiness equation, your brain shuts up. And the minute it shuts up, your default setting is happy. Okay? So this is really very interesting. Huh? Fun is engaging your physical form in activities that will shut your brain up for a while. As long as your brain doesn't complain, you're happy. Now, here's the interesting thing. Friday, Saturday morning, you wake up, you have a little bit of a hangover on top of the fact that the three hairs are still there. Okay? So you wake up, you open your eyes, the first thing you see is three hairs. Okay? And so what happens is your brain panics. It says, are you trying to numb me? You're trying to make me drunk? I'm telling you, we have a problem. We really have a problem. And, and so you get up and you say, you know what, brain? Let's go to the gym. You get on a treadmill and you start running at level six or eight or whatever speed, six or eight. Your brain goes like, okay, this is too fast. I'm going to die. So I might as well just focus on this thing, right? As long as you're doing this, your brain doesn't think about the happiness equation and what's your state. You're happy. You hit the showers. And your brain goes, like, seriously, you're trying to numb me. We have a problem. We need to talk about the hairs. Okay? And as long as you do that, fun becomes really, really interesting because it really starts to work for you as a Panadol would. 
So you have a headache for some reason that you should treat. But instead of treating the headache, what do you do? You pop a Panadol, so you get six hours of quiet. And then the effect wears out, so you pop two Panadols. And then seven hours later, you start to go for extra strength. And then 12 hours later, you start to, I don't know, maybe go for drugs. And that's actually what happens to us. First, we go to a party, and then all of us know that after a while, the parties don't work anymore. So we go to a wilder party. Some of us go to the treadmill, and then we realize it's not working anymore, so we bungee jump. Okay? And, and that is an endless process for a very interesting reason. Happiness, this calm, peaceful feeling, is associated in your body with serotonin. And serotonin is a calmer. It's a hormone where your, body, where your brain is basically telling your body, I'm really okay with this situation. Can we just keep it as it is? Can we just stay where we are? Okay? The endorphins that come with fun are exciters. And so what happens is the more you pump those in your blood, the more serotonin disappears. As a matter of fact, it would not be available as long as you're exciting yourself. And so because of that cycle, and of course, because you're really not solving the problem of unhappiness that you're facing, fun works against you. In a very interesting way, the more fun you have, the more dependent on fun uh, you become to have that excitement that makes you think that you're happy. Now, the answer is to realize that fun is not happiness. And so the right way to do it, just like with your headache, is to fix the reason for your headache. Okay, but if it's maybe a little bit of an allergy or whatever that is, so if you add uh, fun, you add it as a supplement, as a vitamin, so that you stay healthy, it, you're not dependent on it. Reasonable? Now, the other definition is my favorite. Unhappiness happens when events miss expectations. So in that case, suffering truly is just a survival mechanism. Truly is. Huh? It's just like your legs are made to run away from the tiger. We use those to go for, you know, run marathons sometimes. We push our human abilities to the limit. Your brain is made to make sense of the concepts around you and make sure that this environment is safe for you. And we push that to create iPhones and do accounting and all of that nice stuff. Now, if suffering is a survival mechanism, then let's start to understand survival mechanisms, because if we know how those work, we can deal with them the right way. So if, if this room, if the fire alarm goes off, what does that mean? What is it telling you? It te it's telling you there is something uh, you know, that you need to worry about. You might as well leave the room, right? What if you stay? Have you ever tried to do that? It's like, have you ever tried to stay with the fire alarm for five hours? seven hours, 17 days. Most of us do that with unhappiness. The, you know, unhappiness is really telling you there is something wrong, can you do something about it? But we stay with it. But not only do we stay with it, we actually generate it on demand, which is really my most, it's the most ridiculous process we humans have ever generated. The difference between pain and unhappiness. By the way, there is physical pain and emotional pain. Physical pain is you cut your finger, you pull your hand away. Emotional pain is, I feel worried about time, so I keep looking at the watch. Okay? Both are good, because this is London, you know, it's important for my survival to be on time. So I'm looking at the watch to make sure that the, you know, the whole event is as we planned. The difference between physical pain and emotional pain, however, is this. Can you close your eyes and remember the pain you had in your sinuses the last time you had a cold? It's impossible to regenerate that. When the pain is gone, it's gone. But you can think about what your boyfriend or girlfriend said last Friday. And the minute you do that, it's unhappiness on demand. The minute you allow your brain to bring it up, literally, it's the Netflix of unhappiness. It's like, yeah, let's watch that one again. <laughs> okay? And, and seriously, it's so interesting because you can do that the next hour, the next day, the next week for the rest of your life. The record I had was one of my students who walked to me after we spoke about a couple of hours of happiness, and she walked to me and she said, Mo, you have no idea what happened to me when I was 17. She was 84. <laughs> I'm not making this up, I swear to you. It, 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 we can keep holding on to that single movie 
and play it over and over and over for 67 years. Now, just like we rushed through Gatwick Airport, when would be the time when you stop and say, it hasn't changed anything. I mean, all of my happiness is, unhappiness is not working. I realized that, uh, you know, uh, uh, literally four hours after Ali died. So uh, because of all of the training I have been going through for 14 years before he died, I suddenly asked myself a very simple question. I said, look, you have one of two options. One of them is to stay crying about him for the next 27 years. And then 27 years later, on your deathbed, Ali is still not going to be here. Or you can choose to do something about it. Now, the interesting question is this. If this process of unhappiness is triggered by nothing, because that wonderful lady was unhappy about something that happened 67 years ago. Nothing happened right now. It's 67 years ago, okay? And it leads to nothing. It will never bring Ali back. It will never bring him back or actually do anything. By the way, men groom because ladies are doing such an amazing job. And ladies, if your gentleman has a, uh, or I'm, I mean, I'm just using this without gender specification, but you know, if your partner has three hairs, tell them lovingly, hey, by the way, you look so much more attractive without hair, right? And, and then life will go on. Right? If you do something about it, it will go away. But the interesting thing is we stay with it. We stay with it. And you know what that means? This is the most stupid process that has ever been invented by humanity. If you had a friend of yours, any Beckys in the audience? Do we have Beckys? Oh, we have one Becky. So any uh, um, Gretchens? No Gretchen? Good. So if you had a friend of yours called Gretchen, and Gretchen used to always pull you to the side and tell you annoying things about yourself every seven minutes and poke you in the ribs at the same time, then go back to class. Nothing, no change whatsoever. Nothing happened, okay? Would you actually jump up and down of happiness when Gretchen is approaching you? Would you call her and miss her? Would you listen to her? Wouldn't you actually tell her, hey, Gretchen, by the way, would you please, would you please stop annoying me? Why do we not do that with our brains? Why is it that our brains have the ability to lock us on one side for 67 years and we still listen? When we know for certain that Ali is not coming back, that the reason for your unhappiness is not going to change by you crying about it. It's only going to change by you doing something about it. And when you realize that, you realize that this process is absolutely stupid. Now, the reason why uh, is not because your brain is evil at all. It's because your brain really, really likes you. So it goes through a cycle that starts from a thought that produces that emotion, and then you do nothing about it. So your brain goes like, hey, we need to talk because I'm really worried about you. Do, do, you know, I'm sure you have one of those friends who wakes up at 6 a.m. in the morning so excited because he, he or she wants to tell you something, and so they text you at 6, and then they call you at 8, and then they call you at 8.15, and then at 9 o'clock you text them and say, I'll call you at 10. Is that okay if I call you at 10? And once you do that, they stop, right? Your brain is doing exactly the same thing until you tell your brain, I got it, I heard you. I understand that you're annoyed by the three hairs. I'm going to talk to him about it. Okay? When you do that, 90% of your unhappiness goes away. And that truly is such an interesting uh, uh, message because you know what that means? It means that we are 100% in charge of our happiness. By the way, we're not in charge of the events in our lives that will make us unhappy. Every one of us will get tested. As Ali used to teach me, a video game where you push the controller forward and wait 70 years is a very boring game. This game of life, the only times when we learn and develop and become better are the times where life gives us a few interesting challenges. And by the way, actually, if you look back at the times of your life where you faced challenges, today you will realize that five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, these were actually the events that shaped you. These were the events that made you the person that you are today. Then they felt bad, but most of the time, today, as you look back at them, you wouldn't erase them. You wouldn't get rid of them, because they were really so pivotal for you. Now, the question becomes, why do we want to erase this one? Why is this one that's making us unhappy 
so different than every other event that tested us and challenged us and made us stronger in the past. With that, I want to tell you that scientifically, as your brain, by the way, there are, they say that your brain has of the megahertz of your brain, the processing power of your brain, is capable of solving this happiness equation up to 60,000 times a day. 60 to 70% of that, that's a lot of unhappy thoughts. Huh? 60 to 70% of that in the adult brain, by research, your brain will say something's wrong. 60 to 70% of the thought in an adult brain, on average, are negative. This, by the way, changes from country to country. So in, you know, in Colombia, uh, they don't seem to have 60 to 70% negative thoughts. The average seems to come from, right? From Eastern Europe, from Germany, from the UK, from all of the countries where we're taught to be critical. We're taught by education to be critical. Hmm? So the interesting thing is this. Is it possible that 60 to 70% of the events of your day are wrong? Would you even survive if 60 to 70% of the events of your day are wrong? No. The reason why your brain finds it that way is because your brain is solving the equation wrong. If you put the wrong E or the wrong E in your equation, the result is bound to be wrong. Any mathematician will tell you, if I give you A equals B plus C, and I give you the wrong value for B or the wrong value for C, A is bound to be wrong. And this truly is what we actually suffer from. The reason why we are unhappy more often than we should be is because we're solving this wrong. And so all that we spoke about is literally the first chapter of, of, uh, of Solve for Happy. Really, the reasons why we solve this equation wrong are the six, seven, five. The six, seven, five, the six and seven are the reasons we feel unhappy when we shouldn't feel unhappy. And the five is the way I recommend for us to be happy most of the time. Now, um, just, just before we jump into those, some of us raised their hands and said we're happy most of the time. Any of you has a friend that's like that, that's happy most of the time? I'm sure you do, right? Uh, you know, when, when it's, when it's uh, winter, they go like, yeah, it's about time, I want to go ski. When it's summer, they'll say, hey, amazing, it's time to go suntan. Right? Anyone here has a friend who's unhappy all the time? Leave them. Okay, anyway, those, the, those people, hmm, when, it's, when it's winter, they say it's too cold. Right? When it's summer, they say it's too hot. Is, are they getting different seasons, or are they the same seasons? It's the way that each of them is solving the equation. Now, some of us are affected by, most of us, are affected by six grand illusions. Six grand illusions are basically concepts that you grow up to believe so that you'll succeed in the modern world. They tell you as you start to join the, the workforce that control is very, very important. So you start to try and control everything. Do you actually ever control anything? Not at all. Control is an illusion. By the way, by the design of entropy and chaos theory, our universe is built to decay. Our universe is built to go out of control. It's the design of how, of how things are. If you associate yourself with control all the time, what ends up happening is that almost every event misses your expectations of full control. Every single event, if you compare that to your expectations of full control, it's not going to match, and so you're constantly unhappy. Thought, the illusion of thought is one of my favorites. We spoke about how your brain is constantly telling you things. Anyone here who doesn't have a voice in their head that's telling, anyone has more than one voice, please? <laughs> Great, yes. Uh, those who haven't raised their hands are lazy. But yes, uh, so, uh, so, um, so, if you, so, so that voice in your head is, is not an illusion, huh? It, re it really isn't. But almost every, or let's say 60% of the majority, uh, the, or the majority of the Western world believe that this voice is me telling me what to do. Do you believe that? I, I think therefore I am? That this voice is me? Okay, so the most interesting thing is this. If, you, if I ask you a quick question, um, your heart pumps blood around your body to make you survive. How many of you believe that your blood uh, right? How many believe that you are urine? <laughs> the biological product of your kidneys is urine. Then you do, but, but, but you don't wake up and say, I urinate, therefore I am. 
Do you? Okay, so the, the, the question really is, this is a three pound lump of meat. Don't over glorify it. It literally is a three pound lump of meat. Okay, its job is to look around the world and give you concepts that you understand in the form of words. As a matter of fact, MIT did a study in 2009. They put people in MRI machines. They asked them to solve puzzles. They saw their brains lighting in areas where they do problem solving. And then after the, those areas stopped flashing, their verbal association areas, the areas we use to speak out loud, started to light up for up to eight seconds. Your brain found the answer, and then for eight seconds, it was turning it into English. It literally is talking to you. This actually, in science, we call this the internal dialogue. Now, if your brain is talking to you, then everything changes, because the illusion, I think, therefore I am, becomes I am, therefore my brain thinks. And you know what that means? When Gretchen speaks, you can tell her, I don't want to hear this, Gretchen. Or you can tell her, have you any evidence to, to verify what you told me? Or you can tell her, by the way, I heard you, but I don't want to obey. And once you start to see the world this way, the illusion of thought is no longer an illusion and you no longer have to listen. And so I have a very simple deal with my brain. It's the same deal I had with everyone that ever worked for me. We can talk about one of two things. You can either give me joyful thoughts or useful thoughts. To come into my office and complain for 30 minutes, you're not gonna get that. I may let you complain for the first six to you know, vent a bit of emotions, but then afterwards I will ask you and say, what can we do about it? What can we do about it? And if we, if we know what we can do about it, everything changes. So these are illusions. Uh, if you know the truth, you can behave very differently in the modern world. These are also very interesting. Seven blind spots. If a tiger attacks me right now, I can guarantee you my brain is not going to say, wow, look at the muscle tones of those animals. Right? <laughs> it has absolutely no benefit whatsoever in trying to find what's good in the situation. Your brain is designed to look for what's wrong because that has a survival value to it. And so it's designed with filters, assumptions, memories, predictions, and so on, which it adds to the event so that it makes sure it finds what's wrong with the event. And so this is why 60 to 70% of the time we find the three hairs. We don't find the wonderful uh, flower they got last week or the, you know, the, the, the wonderful relationship that we have today. right? Because we're looking for those, we find them. And so if we remove the six and the seven, promise me, I promise you, 90% of the time you won't find any reason to be unhappy. When I started to do this, I'm very, very uh, measured in everything I do, so I started to do this and measure. For four and a half years, every time I solved the equation correctly, surprise, surprise, events met expectations. And so I started to realize, maybe events always meet expectations. Maybe as a matter of fact, I'm either setting the wrong expectations or I'm seeing the events the wrong way. And so it's easier for me to navigate the world with what I call the ultimate truth. And the ultimate truths are my truth, by the way, because one of the illusions is the illusion of knowledge. So I actually don't know if these are true. That would be very arrogant to say. Okay? But, but these are my truths. Every event of my life, when I took them through that filter, it actually was expected. And you have to ask yourself this. Two opposite poles of a magnet attract. Has that ever upset you? Seriously, is if your finger was stuck between them, do you sit around and blame life? You don't, right? Because you're expecting them, because it's the truth. You've accepted that as the truth. So when I worked with my teams in Google, change was the truth. We knew that deals were sometimes are going to change and the CEO is going to change and you know, someone else is going to stop the deal. It's fine. That's how life is. If you don't expect that, you're going to be unhappy most of the time. I will leave those here. Uh, for our questions and, uh, and, and answers. But before I, uh, I open for questions, I would like to remind you of the promise. So if, please, if you found two things that will make you happier, I have every concept of the book available in a free video online. Uh, if you want to read, that's fine. If you want to watch them, that's fine. Uh, but please invest in your happiness. What I ask people is to do what they do with fitness, an hour a day, three to four times a week. Okay? If, you, if you put an hour a day in your happiness three to four times a week, I promise you, you'll be happier. Okay? Uh, spend it reading, spend it, spend it watching a video, spend it with spending it with, start with people that know happiness or people that are seeking happiness. Okay? Or spend it making others happy, because that's the other part of the mission. The One Billion Happy mission is really a reminder to the Western world that you cannot be happy as an individual. 
that that in, in, you know, uh, uh, individual focus that we've uh, acquired since the uh, Great Depression and World War II is not gonna take us forward anymore. Before that, if you guys remember, maybe even until 40, 50 years ago in London, neighbors cared about neighbors. We had compassion to want others to be happy. And we succeeded together. Because we dropped that compassion, our planet is going to pieces with global warming, you know, people are homeless all over the street and we don't care, and there are so many issues in our world, so many issues, because we don't have the compassion to make others happy. So the mission is very straightforward. The mission is invest in your happiness, one to two hours a, 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 you know, a day, three to four times a week, and then spread happiness. And if you do that for me, uh, I think that would be uh, 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 462 champions uh, that would uh, get us to the billion. Thank you, and I'll take as many questions as you want. Thank you. So, uh, I don't know if we have mics or we're going to have to shout. Okay. So, yes. Can you just wait one second until the mic is here? Hi. So you said um, basically one of the things that can cause people to be unhappy is that they have unrealistic filters. So, but my question was basically, how do you know where to set your filter? Because you could actually have a bad partner. Mm -hmm. So you could, it could just be the three hairs or it could be like, oh no, this person's a it's narcissist. An incredible question. So where this do you set that? Truly an incredible question. Thank you so much. So, so the, 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 the whole idea is to start with a realization that you're unhappy. By the way, you may have an incredible partner, but it's just not the right fit. Okay? But you, we, we, the one thing I ask people to do is to truly and honestly be uh, uh, you know, aware Aware, awareness, being, is a very feminine character. And as you know, the feminine is being you know, pushed really hard in this world as if it's a bad thing. But really sitting with ourselves and acknowledging the emotions and not saying, I'm fine, right, is truly the first step of any change. The first step is to tell yourself, I think I'm not happy, right? When you know that, hmm, the second step is to actually ask yourself exactly why. Exactly why? is not events. So the event might be uh, he has three hairs in his, his, in his ear. I'm just making this example because it's funny, but I know that our challenges are sometimes much deeper than that. But that, that could be the, 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 the event. But the thought would be he doesn't take care of himself for me. Now, that's a very interesting thought. That thought could be true or not true. And so what I do, literally, is I tell myself, I, I'm, I'm writing about what I call the happiness flow chart. I tell myself, uh, I call my brain Becky, so not Gretchen. So I apologize, Becky, I really am, okay? Uh, um, but but, but um, uh, the reason, by the way, is I had a friend, a British friend, whose name is As, and when I told her this concept, the next week she came and said, Becky told me. I was like, who's Becky? And she said, yeah, I'm the most annoying girl in school. So, uh, so you're not, I apologize. Everyone, you know, next to Becky, tap her and say, we love you. Okay, uh, but yeah, so I call my, my brain Becky, and, and literally, I question Becky. When Becky, if Becky tells me, he, you know, she doesn't really uh, care enough about herself for you, I say, is that true, Becky? Do you have evidence for this, and do you have evidence against? Okay, this is number one. Number two is if it, if, it believes, if, if it proves to be not true, I drop it. If it proves to be true, I ask myself the second most important question, which is, can I do something about it? Can I go to my partner and say, look, I love this, this, and that about you, but that idea of not taking care of yourself for me is really, it makes me feel, you know, can you do that for me? Very simple. Hmm? And sometimes, instead of keeping it inside to kill us, it's so easy to go out there and say, okay, uh, you know, I'm gonna do something about it. If he or she says no, then good, you have your answer. You, you know, if he or she says yes and tries but doesn't do it, remind them, it's easy. The problem is sometimes there are things we cannot do anything about. And, and truly, when you cannot do anything about them, so, so by the way, your partner, your job, your, the place where you live, your friends, you can always do something about those. 
As a matter of fact, even your parents and your blood relatives, you can do something about those. You owe them love, care, and respect, but you don't owe them your life. Do you understand that? You can always make a choice. And the problem is we don't make the choice and we accept, expect that life will become better. Now, there are things we cannot do anything about, like Ali's death. I cannot bring him back. And sometimes, I hope rarely ever in your lives, but sometimes life will throw you one or two of those. When there is something that you cannot do anything about, spiritual beliefs, not with the spiritual side of them, actually teach us something in most of them that's called committed acceptance. Committed acceptance is two steps. Step number one is for me to accept that Ali is gone and that this is the new reality of my life. No, believe it or not, the truth is I was going to accept it sooner or later. Some parents accept it a year later, some uh, 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 you know, two years later, and some on their deathbed. But you accept it sooner or later. But, but acceptance is not good enough. Committed acceptance is what matters. Committed acceptance is to say to yourself, in the case of your partner, for example, with, with many years behind you or whatever, and then you decide to break up. You accept that this is the new reality of your life, and you tell yourself, can I do something about this so that tomorrow is better than today? That I, you know, I feel better about my relationships, about myself, about the, the past of my life than I feel today. And then after tomorrow, uh, better than tomorrow. All of that is the process. The question is, is it, are, you, are we putting too many filters? I would always side on the, uh, you know, go on the side of caution. If you're unhappy, then there is a problem. Honestly, okay? Unless you're happy and you find a way to be happy, keep doing something about it. Even if that thing is to actually see the truth. And by seeing the truth, I'll give you a very simple example on filtering. When it rains, you know, in two weeks' time, you're going to somehow complain about it. In your heart, you're going to go like, I hate the gray rain of London. When that happens, see the full truth. Filtering, your brain filtering, is actually removing the fact that you could have been born in Syria. And it could have been raining bombs on your head. And so you, you're not seeing the whole truth of not only what it is that you're getting is what we focus on, and not only the negative side of it, but actually what we're not getting, we are the most fortunate 1% of everyone who's ever lived. And sometimes we just hold on to little things by filtering 99% of the truth. And so, I, I, long answer to a very specific question. If you don't feel that things are right, don't settle. You, you deserve to be happy every minute of your life. But don't sit in the corner and cry. Take action after action after, after action until you verify if it's true, if you can do something about it, or if you're, uh, you're going to accept it. Others? While we get another question, can I, can I uh, just add a, a point to this? So one of, part of the work I'm working on now, I'm working on six books in parallel, but the one that will come out first, uh, really is a very interesting uh, insight into the balance between the feminine and the masculine. And, and being aware, uh, believe it or not, I realize that you cannot be happy unless you embrace both. So being aware, being in general is a very feminine quality. Doing is a very masculine quality. And some of us, regardless of body parts, you could be a man or a woman, but if we associate more with the feminine, we tend to feel the emotions, but not do much about them. And if, we're, if you're associating more of you, with your masculine, again, man or woman, you would tend to do things without knowing what you're, why you're doing them at all. You never sit and reflect and understand that you're doing this because of an emotion or a feeling and so on. So, so my, my ask of everyone is to actually keep alternating between that doing and feeling and doing and feeling. And a big part of doing, we, I, I was talk to, talking to, uh, to Lord Richard today, a big part of doing is that analytical thinking of why am I feeling this way, is it true, can I do something about it, and so on. Yes. Um, how do you let, because as you said, there's so much negativity sometimes around you, you might come into work fairly happy, but then people seem to be determined to bring you down because you're the only happy person. Yeah. So how do you sort of, you know, survive, float in this sea of negativity sometimes. I find it quite hard. So ste step number one is decide, is, is decide to leave. <laughs> okay? no, I, I mean it. Don't, don't, don't be rash, rash and leave the next day, okay? But start looking. Six months later, a year later, you're going to find a place that makes you happier, by the way. So search for a place that makes you happier. I've never made, been in an interview where I was being interviewed only. I was always interviewing them to make sure that I will have a good life in that place. 
All right? So that, that's number one. Number two is, um, to, to be very honest, hmm? ask yourself if it really matters. So, so a lot of the time, things at work matter because we tend to believe that work is our life's purpose. For some of us, maybe it is. I think it's a lie. I think, again, it's one of the products of the Great Depression and the capitalism, is to make people feel that they are here to work and that we should survive by working. Okay? The truth is, you work to pay the bills. And then you find your life's purpose after you pay the, pay the bills. Okay? And so if you don't feel that way, you would take work a lot less lightly. We also tend to believe that unless everything's perfect, we're not going to have enough tomorrow. So unless I'm accepted at work and promoted at work and so on, uh, we're not going to have enough tomorrow. That's absolutely a lie. The reality of work is that you have reasonably, you, you don't have enough today, and you're not going to have enough tomorrow, and you're not going to have enough the day after. I know billionaires who complain that there are bil other billionaires that are richer. Okay? And, and yeah, it's, it's the truth of, you know, uh, of, of our human uh, endless uh, cravings. Okay? So, so you always want to ask yourself, if work is not my life's purpose, am I happy with this? Okay? Can I be okay, peaceful with this setup because it allows me to go back home and do other things? The problem is if you don't go home and do other things, then your life is void. I think Mark, I don't know where Mark is, but Mark is a great example of that. Very successful businessman that starts to find his purpose in action for happiness. Okay? And, that's, and that's the idea. The idea is it's always for you to question. Now, if the place is too negative and it's making you unhappy, leave. It's absolutely a no-brainer. You're not stuck and you're not jailed anywhere. If you make those choices, the universe will help. Um, do you ever think that, because um, I found uh, that uh, gratitude absolutely. is what made me truly happy. Absolutely. And I was in that place where, um, you know, I was working hard, playing hard, and I remember watching your Channel 4 interview, and I remember specifically thinking, yes, I've confused fun for happiness, I've been distracting myself. But I found that I'm in a place where um, I'm actually really happy 95% of the time. I'm one of those Fantastic. few people. Um, Flock to her. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think, but I don't necessarily always take action because I, I, I really accept everything that happens to me and I'm always truly happy. Do you think that sometimes you kid yourself or there's a danger that actually being too accepting and always happy might make you lazy or might make you not take actions not that you would have taken? All. Not at all. So, so the truth is they tell us, remember, huh? part of the modern world programming is to keep you constantly dissatisfied. Marketing is entirely built around the idea of you will be ridiculed by everyone if you don't have the iPhone XR. Okay? And, uh, and, and I, uh, Apple will never make an ad that says your iPhone 6 is as good as the day you bought it. Okay? <laughs> they're, they're never going to do that. Hmm? And, and there is that constant... Uh, uh, bombardment of, uh, you know, um, um, uh, TED Talks and, uh, and Harvard Business Review articles, and literally they're telling you, do more, try harder, don't be a, uh, I don't know if that's a bad word in English, but in, in England, don't be a wuss, don't stay on the side, don't, right? I don't know. Huh? The truth is, uh, any smart person will tell you that we do all of this searching for happiness. If there is a way to find happiness without all of this, I'm not saying happiness is to go surfing and not work, by the way. I'm saying happiness is to find that peace and, and calm in you while you do things, amazing things in life. Happier people, by definition, are 12% more productive than unhappy people. Now, gratitude, I'll, I'll, I'll answer three things because this is a very, very good question. Gratitude, by definition, says the happiness equation is solved. So your, the attitude of gratitude is basically reminding your brain over and over that events not only meet expectations, but that they beat expectations so much that you're grateful for them. So that habit of telling yourself, I am so happy with, I'm so grateful for my life, is by definition telling your brain, shut up. It's all good. Okay? This also, by the way, applies to nature. If you've ever asked yourself why we're mostly happy in nature, 
Because when we look at nature, we don't expect a tree to be 90, 90 degrees angle and totally straight. When a tree is a little crooked, we go like, how beautiful. Right? Well, not, you never sit in front of the ocean and say, I love the view, but can someone mute the sound? We just accept things. Uh, our expectation is that you know, nature is going to be a little chaotic, and that's the beauty of it. So, so when, you, when you start to have those things in your life, hmm, uh, you're training your brain to be happy as it is. Your question then is, would that make me complacent? I'm setting a billion people happy target. I could be motivated by the enormous sadness in the world, which, by the way, is what they taught us in school, to only motivate ourselves with the negatives. The truth is, I am motivated by every single smile that you guys give me. It's a beautiful thing to motivate me. If I was motivated by the, the enormous sadness in the world, then I'll tell you openly, a billion is not enough. Okay? If I was motivated by the enormous sadness in the world, even if I reached the billion, one unhappy person would make me cry. But that's not the case. I learned to motivate myself by the positive. Hmm? Instead of uh, being motivated by anger about what's happening in Syria, I can motivate myself by compassion for the people of Syria. And, and next time your brain motivates you with the negative, remember mommy. Mommy and daddy motivated you this way. Your teacher motivated you that way. It never made you happy. It's the wrong thing. Now, having said that, people will start to say, but Mo, in that case, for us to be motivated, unhappiness is good. No, unhappiness is a total waste of your life. There is a difference between pain and unhappiness. Okay? Pain is what motivates us to do amazing things. The pain of missing Ali will never, miss, will never leave my heart. I cry three to four times a week, it's okay. I will always miss him. Having said that, it's not unhappiness, it's pain. I don't grant it the power by saying, you should have driven him to another hospital, you're a very bad father, you're never gonna see him again, what's going, blah, blah, blah. I can, f I can come up with a million and a half Netflix episodes that can make me miserable. But I don't do that. I get motivated by the pain of missing him. When I wake up in the morning and listen to music, we listen to a ton of music together, so half of the songs are reminding me of Hali. And when, when, I, when I get one of those songs, you know what I do? I tell myself, okay, that hurts. Let's go make a thousand people happy today. Right? And to be able to find a way through life where you get yourself to, to be motivated by what's good in life, that's when gratitude starts to be your typical habit of everything that you do. And it's absolutely wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Um, so your theory in general, does it, uh, would you accept the fact that there can be cases where happiness is, or unhappiness is caused by a chemical imbalance? So people, some people believe that you're depressed because it's a chemical imbalance. Uh, no, I actually don't. Uh, I believe that the chemical imbalance is caused by long uh, periods of unhappiness. So, uh, so, so uh, it, you know, if, if, if this is, uh, um, you know, to be debated, you always ask yourself, do we have adrenaline in our blood so that we panic, or do we have adrenaline in our blood when we panic? So the way our, uh, our system works is when we need a specific superhuman reaction, uh, our, blood, uh, our brains use, use hormones to keep that going. So, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, as I said, uh, serotonin uh, is a calmer. What your brain is trying to do is to say, stay where you are, okay? Uh, um, um, dopamine is an exciter. What your brain is trying to do is to say, do more of what you're doing. And these chemical languages also go into depression. Uh, where we start to be flooded with hormones that need to be changed. Now, here is the interesting challenge. The antidepressant industry will try to convince you that it's okay to stay on antidepressants because they are fixing the imbalance. They are, but they are not fixing the thoughts that are causing the imbalance. And so you can see that people who depend only on antidepressants continue to, de to depend on them for a very, very long time. And so my, my ask of every one of us, by the way, this is something I normally ask people very openly. Uh, one of your friends is depressed. Don't ignore it, okay? Because we have seen uh, my, my wonderful, wonderful, incredible daughter. Sometimes I talk about Ali and forget to talk about Aya. My incredible daughter had one of her friends uh, attempting to commit suicide. 
uh, and the idea was that for that little period where, that, where her friend was actually starting to go down, I was moving houses so she wasn't really always uh, responding, and you know, it, it's, it's not right that we actually let that go. So, so ask, if your friends are not feeling great, you know, ask. Uh, having said that, the idea is, can we use the chemical uh, treatment, the modern medicine, to fix the imbalance to a point where we can actually start thinking straight and meditate and do the right things so that we can bring uh, the reproduction of that unhappy hormone less and less and less and less. Yes, behind you. Do you have more than one mic? Because we also have our questions up here. Yeah. Um, hello. Yes, hi. Um, hi. So um, I wanted to ask you about um, happiness and well-being with teenagers. Mm. Um, so I'm a Londoner born and bred. I've completely rebelled against the system. We homeschool our kids and we work from home and we travel the world. Yet as my kids go into their teenage years, they're displaying anxiety and symptoms of depression despite on the outside actually showing happiness. And I'm seeing this not just with my own children, but with plenty of children that yes. I'm engaged with. So I'm wondering what can we do to help them and uh, kind of improve their levels of happiness? So, so reality is that what they're dealing with is much, much more complex than what I dealt with when I was, when I was a teen. So uh, technology tends to magnify everything and it's magnifying the negativity of our world. Our, our world is really in a very bad place. And so they get bullied a lot more often. They don't have to fit in with five kids in school. They have to fit in with the whole you know, universe of social media and so on. And when you take those things away from them by force, they end up feeling that they are deprived of something that is their human right. And so, uh, and so the reality is, in my view, I, I always say children in general, teens, uh, are a little more difficult, but the only way a parent can succeed to raise happy children is to, number one, prioritize happiness. And so in reality, I will say this with, uh, you know, uh, 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 with full commitment, uh, if you uh, raise uh, successful kids that are unhappy, you failed. And that's not what they taught us, by the way. Huh? So when, when my mother, my wonderful mother, was, was raising me, she focused on me being smart and successful and educated and so on. That the idea is, can we actually consider that success is, we're going to make you successful and happy. And so, in, you know, for example, when Ali uh, uh, left our world, Aya uh, took a year and a half off university. If I was focused on success, I would, my immediate reaction would be like a year and a half is too long. But the reality is because these were incredible years where she reflected on her own self in ways that 45-year-olds don't do. I was saying, yeah, so we're prioritizing happiness for a year and a half before uh, she can go back. And she's amazing. If you look at what she's doing at her art university today, it's really incredible because we prioritized happiness followed by success. That's number one. Number two is I will say that to all parents, your children will uh, not do what you tell them, okay? Uh, th is that news to anybody? No. So if you, if you, if you tell your children uh, to not lie while you're lying, they're going to lie. So your children don't do what you do, they do what you say. Uh, so they don't do what you say, they do what you do. And the trick here is I found in, uh, you know, in many, uh, many of my friends, close friends who are always businessmen and successful and so on, is that when the parents start to say, we're going to make this a very happy place, we want to be happy, and we're going to make you happy with us, uh, at actually, uh, the children will follow. Uh, the children just want to do what the parents are doing. So instead of preaching them in any way, my uh, recommendation is to actually practice what you preach. And if, if you practice what you preach, you go much further. I know it's hard because all of us get concerned about our children, but my number one comment was get concerned about their happiness before you get concerned about their safety or success or anything else. Mo, you mentioned five truths, and mm. one of them was design. Can you tell us more about that? In London? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, so I would preempt this with uh, saying that uh, knowledge is an illusion. Okay. So this is my view of, uh, of the world. I could be wrong, so please don't dislike me if I disagree with your point of view. 
Uh, I've, uh, I was born a Muslim, and it's a very conformative uh, religion, and so it forced me to do a lot of things that was going to take over my life. And so at age 16, I decided to announce myself as agnostic, and because I'm an engineer, I did what I call the math of God. Okay? And so in chapter 14, I share what, uh, what I believe is a very different way of looking at the idea. By the way, the God has nothing to do with religion, just so that we agree. Huh? Uh, uh, religion just owned that brand somehow and said, okay, this is our brand. Okay? And if you want to use that brand, you come to us. And par part of what they say is amazing, hmm? but it's not the whole thing. So, so if you separate those two, in my personal view, I realized that the question of is there something out there or not truly is a simple question of probabilities. So if someone tells you there is nothing, they're absolutely wrong because there is no way scientifically you can prove that. If some someone tells you that there is, they're absolutely wrong because there is no scientific way of doing that. And so I did the mathematics. Okay? And the mathematics are very straightforward. If you actually think about it, uh, the mathematics, if you include T, which most scientists don't include in the idea of evolution and natural selection, you would realize that we didn't have enough T to generate what we have. So in my current view of the world, uh, I have a tendency to believe that our world, uh, our world is made up of several factors at the same time. It's made up of your free will and my free will and the way the machine works. And the way the machine works, in my personal view, is hyper-designed. So when a tsunami happens, it's hyper-predicted. If you actually understood the exact seismic forces, the exact height of the water, the exact distance from, uh, from the shore, you would be able to predict that in a very uh, organized way. Uh, and so accordingly, when Ali died, that wasn't just a bad throw of the dice. And when I talk about design, I started to talk about death and design in the last two chapters because my unhappiness was caused by something that goes beyond my physical form. Having said that, I don't think your belief in death or design is a prerequisite uh, to happiness. Uh, I believe that for some of us who lost a loved one, it might be a very comfortable, uh, comforting uh, notion to have. Uh, my personal view, but could be right or wrong. Thank you. So we have time for two more, three more. I'll go faster now, so. Oh, up, 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 yes, yes, up, please. Yeah, shout. I've been doing well, a bit of research. This is now I'm an interesting man. The link between well-being and happiness. Mm -hmm. How much being happy is reliant on having a balanced state of well-being, so having great people around you, being physically capable to achieve expectations or being mentally stimulated in your day to day, or is that being part of your ideal expectations? Uh, so I actually uh, had a, a whole chapter about that in the original book that was deleted by my editors. Uh, <laughs> but, but, and, and, and rightly so, because it's already quite uh, a lot to comprehend. But the, let, let's just say this is the... Uh, oh yes, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, well-being. Is, well, uh, is well-being a prerequisite uh, for your happiness? Yes, I mean, in reality, if your feet hurt all the time, uh, it's harder to be happy. And for some of us, by the way, Actually, well-being is not even a choice sometimes. You know, some of us are cr chronically ill and so on, and my heart goes to those people, but it's actually hard, hard to, f to find happiness when you're not well. Uh, and, and, so, um, and so, yes, um, uh, again, in my next uh, work, I talk very, very clearly about, you know, when the idea when I said uh, you need to find the uh, thought that triggered your unhappiness, before I even sit you down for that exercise, I actually ask you to examine your physical form in ways that allows you to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to differentiate between physical reasons for your unhappiness and emotional reasons for your unhappiness. Having said that, you absolutely rightly said that well-being is a lot more than just the form of your physical form and eating healthy and so on. Parts of it are the surrounding, the, the people that are around you, you know, how often do you give yourself uh, meditation breaks or time to reflect and so on and so forth, uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I would not, uh, um, you know, I, I think if you can manage to do that uh, before you start on your happiness journey, that would be amazing. But I have found that most people actually start on their happiness journey first 
and then they realize the need for their well-being, and then they go further on their happiness journey and realize uh, that they can go further on well-being. Ah, yes, upstairs again, but shout. There are a lot of people that are on the point there, and the Yes. Life's purpose is another pill that's, uh, that's truly created by capitalism. Uh, and I would say that with a lot of uh, respect to that view. Um, uh, I, I was taught that by my son. So uh, uh, a lot of people talk about life purpose and that life purpose is an important component for happiness. Um, so I, I, uh, my son, when, I was, when he was 16, he came to my room, I am that TED Talk-like executive. I set myself big targets and I go chase them and then I make a few slides uh, and, and move to the next target. And, uh, and uh, Ali walked to me and said, Papa, I know your heart, I know you want to make the, the world a better place, but I will tell you very openly uh, that uh, there is no way you're going to fix the world. I was like, Ali, come on, you're never depressive, why are you saying this? And he basically told me something that completely flipped my life upside down. He said, look, Papa, the only thing you can change is your little world, which, by the way, starts with you. So if you change you, then your little world grows. If you manage to change you, then you can impact me and Aya. And if then you can impact me and Aya, maybe you can impact your small team at work, and then you can impact all of Google, and then you may be able to impact whatever. Okay? And so it seems in his view, which now I understand clearly, that you actually never find your life's purpose. Your life's purpose finds you. And in a very, very interesting way, his view was analogous to video games. So in, in his view, he basically said that no one can do deliberate, uh, 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 you know, uh, can have a deliberate choice to achieve a certain place in the game. That the only way you can achieve a certain purpose in the game is to be a good gamer. And the way to become a good gamer is to do it over and over and over and over. And when you're ready, le certain levels of the game will open up. Now, my story clearly is an example of that. I spent my, most of my life in the capitalist way, believing that my life's purpose was to help startups uh, uh, grow, okay? to coach startups, to invest in startups, and so on. I told myself this was my life purpose, and then I started to chase it, and I was good at it. Until life first made me depressed, then let me do the research, then send, you know, uh, I had Ali to teach me, and then took Ali. And obviously, as you can imagine, my life's purpose is this. Or maybe it isn't, I don't know. Hmm? But the truth is, uh, I haven't chosen this. I did not. Uh, you know, I was very, very happy at Google. But, uh, you know, maybe we're chasing the wrong target. Maybe your life's purpose is to become the absolute best gamer you can ever become. Because if you can become the best gamer, not the best gamer in the world, the best gamer you can become. Because if you can become the best gamer that you can become, then the game will show up. That's probably the way to look at it. Yeah. So with that, Mark, thank you guys so much. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.